This is a podcast by Wellhouse Church, where personal spiritual growth is fueled through a variety of practices rather than a single prescriptive time of devotion, where we discuss different spiritual practices that help us be more present with God, others, and ourselves. What's up, practitioners? What's up? I hope you're doing well. Hope you've been benefiting in your prayer life. Yeah, um... Hopefully y'all are using some of these that we're talking about. Um, and once again, I know we said this at the beginning, go pick up a copy of Spiritual Disciplines. Yeah, um, Adele's book is great. There, it's fantastic. There's 70 some odd spiritual disciplines in here. Yeah. And we're only talking about the prayer ones right now. Right. We'll I mean, go through the other ones at some other time. Yeah, at, at some point we will. But so good. This book's been so helpful for me. Yeah. And understanding what it is to live a life of faith outside of just commission and omission. Yeah. Um, and you can get it in the hard copy like that. I got my copy, the Kindle version, for pretty cheap. I don't remember. I bought it yeah, like over a like year ago. Yeah, it's like six bucks or something. Yeah, it's super cheap. Um, so do it. Do the things. Yep. Very, very good resource. Um, but today we're talking about conversational. <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting one. Have you ever done this? Yeah. Okay. So it's fantastic, actually, if it's done well, you know. Yeah, that's the deal. I think it it takes some finesse to understand how to do it and and what how it actually plays out, but it's really helpful. Yeah, and I think I think it does two things. So we'll talk about what it actually is. Well, I guess we need to talk about what it actually is before it, talking about the benefits of it. But basically, conversational prayer is with two or more people and you basically have a conversation but in prayer so everybody goes two three four sentences you know like i'll go two three four sentences and clayton will respond with two three four sentences that are prayers Mm -hmm. and then i can respond back or if there's another person they can join in it's it's just like having a conversation but the things that you say are prayers. Yeah. Now, I think it does two things. Number one, it begins to have me thinking about prayer as something that no longer just happens right before I go to bed or right when I wake up in the morning or in my own private time. Yep. It, it gets me into a rhythm of praying in more casual settings. I guess more it, casual. I yeah, mean, yeah, sometimes yeah. it can be more formal, but yeah, yeah, it can for sure. Especially if you're in like group spiritual direction or something like that. But yeah. I guess there's actually three things it does. The second thing it does is it gets you praying in front of people. Yeah. Mm. How can you ever gain the confidence to pray for someone? If you can't pray in front of other people. If you can't pray in front of someone. Yeah. Uh, So I think conversational prayer is a great way to do it, to get comfortable praying in front of other people. And then, (laughs) what? I was just thinking, um, so I did this with a charismatic group. Okay. um, Where I was attending, I was on the worship team, and we would do this every Sunday morning. Okay. Before the service started. Okay. The entire worship team. Um, the the pastor who was also on the worship team, um, the tech team, we would all go in the back and we would do this okay. for about 30 minutes before service started. Just praying for the service, praying for the spirit to move, all those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Two things that happened in that group that made me really uncomfortable to pray. One, sometimes because I was overseas, they would be speaking Dutch. They would be praying in Dutch. And you wouldn't know what they were saying. And I'm like, I don't know how to respond to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two, um, because it was a charismatic sometimes tradition. Sometimes they pray in tongues. Sometimes they were praying in tongues. And so I'm like, I just had to like, you know what? I feel like the spirit is leading me to pray this. Yeah. <laughs> um, because lots of times it wasn't in English. Um, yeah. 
Um, and lots of times, mo- more times than not, it was in, a, in their prayer language. Yeah. And so like, it was, it was tough. Yeah. Um, and make me as a six gave me so much anxiety oh, <laughs> to yeah. pray in front of other people. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but I just, you know, it's one of those things that it is kind of spirit led. It is this form of spontaneous prayer. Yep. Um, and in order to become comfortable, you have to learn to follow the spirit. Yeah. Right. Let the spirit guide your prayer. Um, the other thing that I love about conversational prayer in this way is, um, this is not always true depending on the group setting that you're doing it in. Mm. But if you do this with some of your closest friends, Mm. my fear is that we're much more vulnerable with our friends than we are with the Lord. We say things to our friends that we would never say to God. And by doing conversational prayer, it gets you to a place where you feel comfortable slash confident being more vulnerable in your prayers. Mm. And look, you know, people got different interpretations on this. David writes most of the Psalms. Yeah. David's a scary prayer. David prays some stuff. I'm like, yo, you ain't supposed to tell me that, bro. You people on not on YouTube, y'all can see my head shaking. Y'all can't see my head shaking vigorously. That dude prayed some scary, scary stuff. I mean, David prayed for God to kill people. Yeah. David prayed for God to take their name out of the book. Yeah. David prayed all kinds of really, really scary stuff. Um. At times, it almost seems like in his own prayer, David is cursing God. Yeah. Um, like just really, really dark stuff in his prayer life. And what that shows, I, I'm sorry, I, I got to cut in on this. What, but what that shows is because we're so scared to pray in vulnerability. We're so scared to pray what's on our heart and what's mm-hmm. on our minds, to say what we're feeling to God. We're so scared. Why? He knows what you're feeling. Yeah, that's the thing. He knows how you feel. Yeah. Just say it. Yeah, I think that's that's the thing is it, it can be one of two things. Number one, we know that God already knows it, and so we don't feel like we need to say it. Mm. Or we don't really believe that God can do anything about it. Mm. So we don't feel the need to share it. Yeah. Cause David prayed a lot of crazy things. Um, yeah. probably, the, probably the most vulnerable prayer in history. Well, or at least recorded. Yeah. So that's the part I was going to say is it, it's hard to say that because we also have the most of his prayers, right? At least recorded. Um, and that dude saw some crazy things happen. Through the power of God. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, David's life kind of pretty much just shows the power in prayer and the power and vulnerability in prayer. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, Sorry, that was a big... Well, but I think it, it needs to be said because here's my fear. My fear is that most American Christians, and I can't remember, I'm going to try to look this up as we're talking, but who who came up with this? But there's a thing called moralistic therapeutic deism. Mm. Yeah, you and I have talked about this before. Um, I don't remember who came up with the idea, though. His name's Christian Smith. Okay. Pretty sure. Hang on. Mm, Yeah. By Christian Smith and Melinda Lundquist. They did a study. They're sociologists. They did a study. And what they found is that most Christians 
or most people that profess to be Christian actually didn't, they didn't meet the biblical qualification of a Christian. Mm. And what they were better described as is moralistic, therapeutic deists. Now, there are three unique words that need to be explained. Moralistic, that they need to some live some level of morality. Therapeutic, that church is a place where I experience healing. Yeah. Deistic, that God is up there and he mm-hmm. set the world in motion. We are down here. But we're down here and God doesn't actually intervene in the world. Yeah. God just kind of did it. He's like a puppet master. He wrote the screenplay. He wrote the screen right. And that's it. Like, yeah. He wrote the story and that's all he did. How depressing is that point of view though? That God is not involved in in our lives, like intimately involved. Um it's definitely not a point of view I want to have. Yeah, it's kind of depressing. Um the unfortunate piece is I think they're right. Mm. That that is most Christians. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um that it's just, I need to be a good person and church is a place for me to be encouraged and experience some level of healing. But I'm deistic and I believe that God set the world in motion and he wrote the story. I know the end of the story, but God doesn't actually intervene in my everyday life. At first, when you said, I think they're right, I was like, whoa, hold up, bro. <laughs> oh, that that's the way we yeah, should think about it. No. I was like, uh... <laughs> no, I think they're right in their premise that that's most Christians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, I think a lot of that stems from cultural Christianity and the rise of the nineties and, you know, just a lot of the things that the way it played out in culture that, you know, Christian being Christian was a thing of privilege and, you know, just uh, all the things. Right. But because of that, if you're a deist, you don't need to pray because it doesn't do anything anyways. Yeah, because God's up there. God's up there, and I'm down here, and God's not actually concerned with what's going on in my life, and even if he was, he's not going to do anything about it. Yeah, fundamentally, God is unattainable. Yeah, he is uber transcendent. Yeah. He's all the way up there, and he is unreachable for me. Yeah. That's really what deism is, and or that's a big piece of deism. Deism is much more than that, but... um. Because a true deist, so like Thomas Jefferson, everybody says, you know, America is founded on Christian beliefs. No, that's not true. Um, the God in our God we trust, not the Christian God. They may have thought it was. They mm-hmm. may have got a lot of foundations from Christianity, but it's not Christian. Thomas Jefferson was a deist, and, and he's the easiest one to pick on because he has the most easy one but thomas jefferson has his own bible yeah and he took all the miracles out because god doesn't intervene in the world and a miracle is god's intervention in the world so he took all the miracles out of the gospels and oh by the way he got rid of the old testament yeah um or at least part of large it. pieces and also because god doesn't do miracles Ding, ding, ding. He got rid of the resurrection. And what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15? Resurrection is fundamental. We're not Christians if not for the resurrection. Yep. So according to Paul, don't get mad at me if you like want to believe Thomas Jefferson is Christian. According to Paul, he's not. Yeah. Um, so... Because God can't interact in the world in deism, which I think most Christians probably end up somewhere in there, um, either unknowingly or explicitly, because I also think, this is not true for everyone, I also think a lot of Reformed people are deistic. Yeah, in, in some way. But like, let's think about that for a second. Let, let's think about why somebody would want to believe that way. Because it makes it easier to explain the horrific things. 
Well, it makes it easier to explain why when I do hope for something, it doesn't happen. Well, that too, but like it makes it easier to explain the Holocaust. Yeah. You know, like how could God allow in Deuteronomy, he calls the Jews his chosen people. How could he let his chosen people um, be slaughtered by the millions? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, well, because he can't interact. Well, I do wonder if if most people ever get there in their faith journey. I mean, because that's that's pretty far down the line, yeah. right? That you begin to think at a macro level about God's interaction in the world. Sure. Um, I think people are just more selfish than that, and so I think, hey, somewhere along the way, I was a Christian or believed in God, and my parents got divorced, and I prayed that wouldn't happen, mm-hmm. and. It did, so God must actually not be able to intervene in the world, or yeah. he would have done this, because his, his Bible says that he doesn't ever want somebody to get divorced. No. So, yeah, that must not be true. My grandma died, and I prayed for her, mm-hmm. and God didn't heal her, so God must not be able to do these things. Um, even if he says, with the faith of a mustard seed, I can move a mountain, why well, had immense faith that God would heal my grandma, and he didn't, so God must not be able to intervene in the world. Yeah. I think it's... a uh, it's an easy place to get for self-preservation. Sure. It's an easy place to end up so that I can I can still have an element of faith in God. I don't have to give up faith, but I also don't have to... I now have some kind of answer why God doesn't do the things I want him to do. Yeah. Versus, I mean, your alternative is to just say that God's at work doing things outside of your point of view in the world. Yeah. You have no idea the impact that that thing that you were praying for has had on other people. Right. Um, so I think it's really easy for people to end up at deism. I, I mean, I just, I think it is. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about deism, but yeah, this is one of the reasons I think conversational prayer is important as well, because we get to see the faith of other people. Yeah. Ooh, yes. Man, you know, I, I've been dealing with some stuff personally for a while, and as people have been praying for me, God reveals himself to me in the prayers of other people. Mm. The faith of other people strengthens my faith. And I, I get revelation from the Lord through the prayers of other people. And that's true in conversational prayer, too. I mean, even in two, three, four sentence sections, Jesus is revealed through the faith of others. And their faith, excuse me, can strengthen your faith. Yeah. So, how do you do this? Here's what I would say go to your ripple or your covenant group, or accountability group, or whoever it is, and you all get together. And if you don't have one of those, you can reach out to us, and we'll, we'll build you one. Or um, if you just have two or three really good friends that are believers that you feel very close to, you all get together. And here's how I would say you do it. One of you pick to be the guinea pig and one of you volunteer and say, we can pray for me and pick something going on in your life, Mm. whatever it may be, you know, financial struggles, marriage, kids, friendship, you know, whatever, pick a relationship with your mom, you know, whatever it is. Pick one and tell them the story, update them on where you're at in this journey, and y'all begin to pray together. But don't do it in a formal way. That's where we get hung up, that we think we go around in this circle and everybody prays for five minutes each until we get through everybody. That's not what this is. One of you begin to pray in a conversational way, just having a conversation as if, Jesus, we're in the room, and you're directing your conversation to Jesus 
on behalf of the other person. Yeah. And just live in this moment. It's a very kind of experiential thing. But as you pray, pray three, four sentences and stop and rest in that moment. This is the other thing. Just like in a conversation with friends, you're not it, talking all the time. It doesn't always have to be filled with sound. You don't always have to speak. Yeah. Rest in that moment for three or four seconds, five seconds, ten seconds. And then someone else, whoever feels led, now you pray. Yeah. And you go through this rhythm. And it can be awkward in those four to five seconds. Sometimes it's longer, right? Sometimes it's 15, 20 seconds before somebody like, feels the spirit moving them to pray something right yeah um and so sometimes it can be awkward but that's where you go back to the more contemplative prayer that we were doing last week right embracing the presence of god yep um then it's no longer awkward because guess what god's there right the spirit is in the room yeah embrace that feeling um we see in scripture that when two or more gather in his name he is there right um embrace that feeling and it's no longer awkward